to you from Portland, Oregon. This is GovLove, a podcast about local government. GovLove is produced by ELGL, the Engaging Local Government Leaders Network. ELGL engages the brightest minds in local government. I'm Kirsten Wyatt, a fellow at the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University, and I'm also the ELGL co-founder. Today, I'm joined by City of Philadelphia Director of Digital Services, Sarah Hall. Sarah, welcome to GovLove. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Today, we'll talk about Sarah's work in Philadelphia, the phila.gov development strategy, and the digital services team work plan for 2023. But first, as always, let's get started with a lightning round. Sarah, what is your most controversial, non-political opinion? That fruit does not belong in or on dessert. It's just wrong. Ooh. I thought you were going to go pizza, which is a kind of a common, a common um, opinion. But tell me more. Why did you have a bad experience with a fruit based dessert? I did not, but I just feel like it's usually upsetting. Like I understand an apple pie. I understand pies and tarts, but like that's like a breakfast thing. Have it with coffee. Um, I don't like desserts need chocolate and need to be decadent and I don't think that fruit belong in any shape, way, shape, or form. <laughs> All right, bold, bold. And who is your celebrity best friend, a famous person that you know that you would click with? I know it's Lizzo. Um, I have been a fan of her since like, just for a very long time. And I have seen just like over the past few years, her career grow and align with like what I'm interested in. I always wanted to like, I would love to sing. I'm not very great, but I would love to sing and dance. And I imagine, like, if we got together, she could teach me a thing or two about dancing and we just have a great time. All right. Great answer. All right. And last lightning round question. What was the first music purchase that you made independently and what format was it on? So this was a really hard one because I remember, like, the first thing I asked for, but, like, an actual purchase, I want to say it was a CD back in 2000, um, The Source Presents Hip Hop Hits Volume 4, which brought you um, Country Grammar, um, It's So Hard, Wobble Wobble. Um, I'm a big like hip hop, like 2000s that era fan. And it's just a really good, uh, it's like a good compilation. I mean, and that stands the test of time. I mean, that's not, we've had some embarrassing answers for this question. And so I think you can, you can hold your head high with that response. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So let's get started. Um, start off by telling us about your career path. How did you get to the city of Philadelphia? Yeah. So, so I think, um, I, I, I think this is like pre, pre-career path, but I always like mentioning this is like, I grew up in Delaware and before, like probably in my up until I was in my early 20s, I was like known for playing soccer. So that was like my whole life from like three or four to like probably 25, 26. Like I went to college with a soccer scholarship and that's what really brought me to Philadelphia. I was really interested in like math and science. I went to math and science high school and I wanted to do civil engineering, but I needed a scholarship to go to college. So uh, Philadelphia University was one of the first schools that like came and visited my house and recruited me. I had like a checklist of like I wanted to start, I wanted to play, and I wanted to do something like civil engineering, but they didn't have civil engineering. So I went into architecture, which opened up like the world of design. Um, so my degree was in a, like a five year bachelor's of architecture. And around year three, I started like questioning like, why are we still making buildings if we have so many old buildings? and who are we even designing these things for? And I would look at architects like Frank Gehry and see like this, like it was art in my mind and less functional. And I learned about uh, Buckminster Fuller in my third year. And that's when I really started to think about what does it look like to design more like sustainably, but also designing for people. So I kind of pivoted and started thinking about human centered design um, then. So I finished my, my degree and I didn't want to go into an architecture firm. I worked in one for three months and it really was not my cup of tea. Like I was doing bathroom elevations and the registered architect who is my mentor was also doing them. And I just, it was not my, um, not my cup of tea. So I ended up 
uh, going directly to grad school short, you know, we graduated in a recession and it was like everyone moved back home and I just went to grad school. I went to university of the arts um, and I have a master's in industrial design. And at that time it was focusing more on human centered design. So we got into um, having conversations with real clients and designing for the people that would be the end users. Um, and it really wasn't even digital then. It was still in that realm of, you know, whatever meets the client's needs. And that's kind of where I mm-hmm. think, you know, the background in design plus meeting people's needs was really something that drove me forward. So I graduated and I was like, you just did seven years of school, take a break. So I, I, I was working in restaurants at the time and I kept working in a restaurant doing freelance work and then I kind of got fed up with that and found my first, uh, my first full-time job, which actually was for a uh, all-inclusive travel agency and it just like wasn't meaningful I had worked in healthcare before eventually got back into healthcare and I was working in a place where I was enjoying the work but I wasn't getting to do like the meaningful work that I intended to do I thought like speaking to patients bettering their interactions with healthcare would be really important and it just wasn't happening so um I just remember maybe early 2017, I got a DM in Slack from the old uh, director of our department. And he was was like, would you ever apply to this? I was like, you know, maybe I will. And it was the product manager for Philadelphia. So I applied and I like really invested in the interview because I just really wanted the job. It seemed perfect for me and I I got it. Mm -hmm. So that really led me to the city. And I think what's kept me there has been just being able to do the work and the opportunities that our teams have had um, really in the past uh, six-ish years. I started in 2017, so six-ish years now. And it's, it's, it's so interesting hearing your path um, because it's really rooted in service. And so it just is a reminder that, that we can make a difference if we are really focused on the people that we serve and knowing that there's not one right path to get you um, into leadership. And so I, I I love that you shared that story Um, and, and very unique, but I bet also something that people can relate to is when they meet you. So share with us more about the work that the digital services department does at the city. Um, Where is your department housed? And then the type of work that you're doing each day. Yeah, so we are now in the Office of Innovation and Technology. Um, We officially formed with me being the director March of last year. Um, So I feel like we've had, you know, um, I guess I'll finish that thought there. So we're in the Office of Innovation and Technology and report to the Chief Technology Officer. Um, He reports to the CIO, Mark Wheeler, and then Mark reports to the Chief Administrative Officer, Stephanie Tipton. So and then she reports to the mayor. So we're kind of in this space um, where we're able to have direct impact on the work we are doing and, and kind of make our own decisions to do the work that we do. Um, I would say that the kind of work we do is, is a lot of the Philadelphia things, but we've also like, when we came into the Office of Innovation and Technology back in 2019, um, and that's a little bit of a story in itself that I'll maybe dip into. It's just, we were, you know, when I started in 2017, we had moved out of um, OIT and we were in the, called the Office of Open Data and Digital Transformation. And I was hired as a product manager of Philadelphia and my colleague, um, Gene Adamson, who's now the director of content, was the content strategy practice lead. And we were really giving a mandate um, to re- redesign and rebuild Philadelphia. So that was happening. We were doing that work. And then when we had leadership changes in 2019, we had conversations around where our teams would be. There was always a promise made that phila.gov would move back in the OIT. And myself, always wanting to continue to work on digital products, knew that moving, you know, phila.gov, which I felt like was our baby, back into OIT, plus um, the need to, I think, establish user experience as a discipline uh, mm-hmm. was something that, you know, we wanted to do because prior to moving back into OIT, the product team was design and development. We had a really great um, software engineer and she was moving back to OIT and I wanted to still do development for uh, digital work. So we moved back into OIT and 
we've kind of had like finishing up fill.gov was a big part. So finishing up meaning the remaining features, continue to migrate all of the content, but also um, touching more applications. So one of the things we've been really trying to do is um, be more integrated in OIP's processes. We're doing more applications in house and how do we as designers and content folks begin to and, and continue to work on applications. So that's kind of the direction we're going in right now is continuing to build and support fill.gov because the website will never be done, but also mm -hmm. starting to bring some of our expertise into um, applications. And let's talk about fill.gov. I mean, you've, you've touched on it and, and obviously you've got your start with the city um, working on the content side, but, but talk to us about the backstory of the site and um, where things were perhaps when you started or even before and then where they are now and then what you envision for the future. Yeah, so I'll kind of start as I was coming in. So this is like June of 2017. Um, alpha.fill.gov had existed and I think it just, we had just moved to beta.fill.gov and there was a mandate and capital funding associated with all this work. So when Jean and myself came in in 2017, it was um, really putting a focus on finishing the site. So the content team, which Jean managed, was really trying to have, well, not trying, they were, having conversations with department partners and migrating all of the content, but not just like copying and pasting, they were having facilitated conversations with each of the departments to talk about the content they had and what was redundant, what was outdated, what needed to be rewritten, and really moved it into a new organizational structure that was, I would say, a little bit more intuitive for residents and businesses. So the thoughts that, you know, as a resident or business, you don't need to know that you know, the water revenue department handles water bill paying. Um, you just need to know that you need to pay your water bill. So how do we make that easier for people? And how do we make it more like more pathways into the same, um, the same content? So it's written once and it might show up other places throughout the site. We use a lot of reusable components. So the content team really led that charge of helping us as a product team understand what do our uh, departments need to give their information or like put their information out there for um, our residents and businesses? And then my, was, go ahead. Just a quick question. Um, was user research built into that process at that point or was that something that was new or introduced during that time? I would say that there was, um, I think, that we had back then we had a lot of fellows and we found some really unique ways to fund some a lot of folks um, on the team and there was a large um, user research like usability testing done that wrapped up in 2017 like early 2017 prior to us coming in but i would say the the site wasn't built out to the part the point it is now um, so there was i think services was really the only built out full feature we might have had i want to say less than 10 departments migrated. Um, so it wasn't as robust as it is now, um, but some of that was done and um, happened throughout, say, like I would say during the features, um, but the, the bulk of that was done a little bit before and it's something we're working on now as well. The content team really focused on migration and getting all of the departments to the new platform and we build out those remaining features in the information architecture. So programs, um, news and events, and other large uh, either page types or components that we found um, through conversations with department partners would be helpful and necessary to uh, disseminate information to our residents and businesses. Um, in summer of 2018, we changed over the homepage. So um, basically fill it out of if you went to it, it would still take you to le the legacy site and beta would be the new site and that changed. So the beta site was now the homepage. It wasn't a huge deal, but it turned out to be. We went on a little roadshow, myself and Jean, and talked to departments around what those changes meant. It didn't really mean much, but um, it was, it kind of stirred a lot of conversations around uh, and it was, it was interesting. But um, I would say, you know, Summer 2018 was like, it's fill.gov now. 
but it wasn't done um, in 2021, I want to say we finished. So, you know, moving into OIT in 2019 and then the pandemic hitting. And uh, I feel like really, like I think the hard work that everyone on had done on Philadelphia really prepped us for um, the pandemic or like the response and creating um, a space or digital presence for us to, to get information out quickly. Because I think in 2020, like I remember having these conversations between myself and um, other folks in, in Philadelphia of management. And we were like, oh, the website's almost done. It's going to be great. Like we can focus on other stuff and, you know, focus on like, what does Philadelphia 2.0 look like? And how do we continue to build and become, you know, and then the pandemic hit and it was like, oh no, we need to, <laughs> we, we ended up building like within a, less than a week with uh, myself, um, Jean, and then Carissa Demai, who um, at the time was a software engineering manager. Um, we ended up building out the COVID-19 page with the health department really, really quickly in the mayor's office. So it, it kind of proved that we were ready for not anything, but a lot of things and we could build quickly and continue to support what we needed to do. So um, finally, in 2021, we moved everything off the legacy, legacy site and shut down that old server. Um, so now we're like free of that and moving forward. And, you know, you talk about, you know, when you were when you were going around and shopping around the new homepage, you know, having some interesting conversations. Um, share with us some of your advice or tips or techniques for for managing change and for helping people deal with change, um, especially when it might seem uncomfortable for them. Yeah, I think we kind of started, like I remember having conversations at um, kind of the commissioners or like city leadership meetings that were like small five minute conversations. So we had those and we talked about like what Philadelphia meant and the value that we brought. Um, and then we had a chief of staff who really like wouldn't approve any new budgets for websites being published. So we had the support from the mayor's office. And that's something that we've had um, really since the, I feel like since the beginning of my time here is they direct us to us. They direct like any new requests to us. So there's very few sites that are be being created outside of Philadelphia. Um, and that's was great to have that support. And we've had support um, from our leadership as well. But I would say, like making sure people understand, you know, at the end of the day, like we care that you're on Philadelphia.gov because it helps us like show as a, a unified front as a city and it helps us, you know, like I would say own like the presence and, you know, that's really important at the end of the day to ensure we have and maintain people's trust in government. Um, so, I feel like that getting that across and then talking about how easy it is. And at the end of the day, like our department partners own their content and they're able to go in and edit and update and all that jazz um, really easily um, because the governance models that our teams have set, the content team has set up. So it's giving back control. It's saving the city money. It's saving departments money. And it's really, um, you know, if you go to search on Philadelphia, you're able to find what you need and you know, leaving things off in like the distance or wherever they might be is something that we're trying to really, really get away from that we have been able to. But I think it's like setting a level of understanding and then having conversations around concerns and then addressing them. You and your colleagues developed a strategy and developed and proposed a strategy for Phila.gov. Um, tell us more about that and, um, you know, specifically about the strategy, but then also the decision to to be so strategic in, in putting together um, something that you're proposing and then working toward? Yeah, so I would say that that has always been tough. It's something we've had like in the back of our heads on a list to do, but it never seemed as important as it seemed in the last year or so. Um, you know, prior to like my start was the product manager of Phil.gov. I felt like during that time we were so focused on building and then we made that shift into me becoming um, the UX practice lead when we moved into OIT. And when I became the director of digital services last year, um, it was just like, well, this is enough. We need to have something. We're having an administration come up in the next year. So 
administration change come up in the next year. So we really want to figure out how we continue to support the foundation of build.gov. We moved really, really quickly when we were designing and developing. And I think we've done a really great job, but a lot of the things that like they feel silly to me now or to us now is just like, we don't always have a great answer as to why someone should or should not be on fill.gov. Like we have the answer, but we're still having the same conversations we've been having for the past four or five years. So how do we make sure that we create um, create the, the foundation in place to make sure we have policies and procedures and uh, enough information around like moving this thing forward, but also making sure it maintains um, its own integrity and sustainability. Um, so, you know, really putting a, a high priority on getting that done. It started with conversations between myself, um, Jean and Carissa, who I've been working on the product for a while. Um, I, and then the former director of software engineering, Dan, who had left the city. And then um, our new director of UX, who started as my backfill, um, Liz Brown. And we ended up, you know, I facilitated these conversations. And then one day, just like, well, we need to draft something. We drafted something and then we fine tuned. Um, we just finished up sharing with our, our team members and we're going to be doing info sessions for department partners in the next month. Um, we of course went through IT leadership and had conversations with them. So they're all aware and supported it, but it's just, you know, we really wanted to get something out there. And it's, it's I would say it's, it's like the next five year plan, but it's very strong in the next year and a half and less uh, detailed in the, the following um, through like 2024 to 2026, just because, you know, I think it's really important for us to have a product manager back in place. You know, we've all like the Philadelphia management team is representation from each of the disciplines, UX content and software engineering, but we all have a little bit of our own biases. So if we could have someone come in and really think about like, what do analytics say? What do departments say? Um, department partners say, what do we get from usability testing and how do we build a roadmap from there? That would be extra, extra important. Um, but also someone to like really own and drive these policies that we'll be creating. Um, what do those need to look like? How do we make sure that they're enforced? Um, we're talking about creating a few different working groups. So what is a governance committee for fill.gov look like? Because at the end of the day, like, who should make the decision as to what belongs on the city's website? Um, and then what does a working group look like? And working groups, I feel like are our department partners. So how do we make sure that they are ne their needs are met and the site remains relevant for them? Uh, we don't want to start having people fall back off and creating their own websites again, because that's just not good for us. I would think too, the strategy document has to give you additional credibility with your department partners and and how has that been in in being able to share that strategy back to the departments you're working with yeah i'm not i'm not completely sure yet we um i think one of the things that i i really value and um it's something we haven't really talked a lot about um is i would say it's now two years old um there's a, a newsletter that focuses on fill.gov for our department partners that are content creators of the site. And that has been such an integral part to keep people in the loop. Um, it started as like a concept from the content team and it has been, um, you know, we have features, we did a software engineering feature, we did a UX feature one month, but um, that has been a really great place to like push out information. And I think we want to, and we have open office hours now um, and we want to, continue that like two way conversation, because I always think of us as like the experts in um, in the web in application in this work, but our department partners are really the folks who are providing services and all of the things that our residents and businesses need. So if we're not listening to them and we're not meeting their needs, then at the end of the day, we're not able to be successful or we won't be as successful as I think we, we could be. We could always make a really cool site and that would be great. But if we're not addressing the needs and we're not being relevant, then I don't think that's as important as as the as the, the, the previous. Such an, an important point that, you know, it's not just the public facing aspect of Philadelphia, but it's also 
the fact that you're providing an internal service and that you are there to work with and serve, you know, the departments. Um, tell us more about, you know, so the newsletter, that's a great way. I saw some hearts and some thumbs up um, from our Zoom attendees. Um, what are some other ways that you continue to keep your content creators in the departments engaged and up to date, up to speed, um, especially around things like best practices um, that, that you would recommend? And, you know, for you, especially coming from a content background, um, the ways that you that you engage departments. So I would say that um, the thing that has always been in place was standards at Phil and Echo, which are our standards or website standards. And I think that we did, I don't remember how long ago it was. It was probably like in the last year and a half or so, but we did like an overhaul of like restructuring it and making it because we used to have it within the format of a department page which i thought was very confusing so we built it somewhere else and we kind of reorganized it and what we've been looking at was how do we make you know i said we moved really quickly we didn't really think about how the back end was designed so um you know some content folks are looking at that some of the dev team is looking at that but as we build new features we're trying to think how we make it clearer and we actually march 6 have a new staff member starting which is very exciting but this is answering the need of you know right now the content team and software engineering teams do a lot of our trainings and they're held like once every six weeks which we know with the administration change coming up we're going to see a lot of changes in maybe some of the comm staff some of the folks coming in being new we want to make sure that we're able to address all that and we haven't had like a dedicated like what does it look like to be or to continue learning as a content content contributor to Philadelphia and we hired um, we drafted and hired a partner success coordinator and that person's going to really take over um, the trainings and help build out um, what that looks like for the future so it's it's an interesting role in that we don't have anyone um, doing that and we also don't have many folks dedicated solely to a product um, so having you know, this this one person come on and kind of like their first part of this will be, what does it look like to take over the existing trainings? And then what are our opportunities and how do we keep people engaged and continued learning around the lack of? So that's really a big part. Um, yeah, and I feel like the, the other portion is that, you know, our content team has been so in, in, um, in line with so much of what we've like the content team has been so in line with so much of what the departments need um we have they have like portfolios where you know one person has a health department one person has streets one person has so they have like these large and small departments which they are experts in um and they're able to interact with them so um, with Jean leading that and the team kind of working through that, it's been really nice to have that connection. Um, and then I feel like that's kept us kind of in the loop and like our, I would say like our finger on the pulse of what um, departments might need. But I feel like, you know, creating these working groups and having more of that two-way communication in an open forum is going to be really, really valuable. And we have a great question in the chat from Vicki with the City of Austin. Um, and, and I think you've answered a lot of her question, but want to drill down on the specific types of trainings, tactics, and approaches that have worked well. And I would also love to hear, has there been a topic or an interest in something that surprised you um, as you've been working with departments and they're, they're seeking to tap into the expertise of your, of your team? Um, I, I don't know if we've really... Um, gauged how effective like we know that people do like take these trainings and then they're able to do things better i think that the kind of like hands-on approach the content team has taken to helping people understand why plain plain language is important like that is a huge very big important thing like they have done such a great job to stress what that is um i think from the kind of the ux and the development like side we've really talked about like accessibility. So um, I'll give a small example that, you know, all of our, every time, not every time, a lot of the time people are just like, well, this isn't flashy enough. We need more pictures. We need more blah, blah, blah. And when we think about 
the residents of businesses we're serving and how important accessibility is and how important, like, you know, for a very long time, like 2017 to probably 2019, we were seeing 60% usage, like on an average of desktop, 40% of mobile. So we knew we were going to have to make that switch eventually. And as the pandemic hit and people were home and they didn't have personal devices or they didn't have personal computers, we saw that kind of switch to like 60 to 70% um, mobile. So when you know when people don't have a lot of data, like why are we adding these images that might require a lot of download time, take up a lot of data and aren't really useful. They're just catchy. Like at the end of the day, it's how do we get this information to people and how do we make sure that it's understandable? Um, how do we make sure we meet people where they are? So I would say just like the continued efforts and conversations that the teams have with them, like internally between us all, and then also with department partners and building on like the backbone of like, what are best practices for being accessible? What are best practices to meeting our, our end users, our residents and businesses, um, and really driving that forward um, through like everything we do. So tell us what's coming up for your team in 2023. Um, what are the major projects that you'll be working on, or at least the things that you can anticipate um, working on um, this year? I will say it's like, in my mind, I'm just like catching our breath, honestly. Um, it has been a roller coaster. Um, I've mentioned that we've moved really, really quickly with Phil.gov. It's building out that foundation or continuing to build out like the gaps that we're seeing making sure that we have the strategy in place, then we start building on some of those um, policies and procedures, um, but also continuing to incrementally improve the platform to make sure it remains relevant. Um, you know, we've established, we, I would say like we have established teams in content strategy, user experience, and then software engineering, but as digital services and our concept of digital services as a whole within the city, we're fairly young. So, you know, I've been thinking a lot about what does digital services mean in Philadelphia? How do we continue to um, strengthen our relationship with our partners in the software engineering team? How do we continue to build relevant products for the city? And really think about how internally we build our vision and strategy. And I, I've been you know, really loving all of the stuff coming out of the Beck Center with the, this digital services network and tapping into a lot of those resources, which have been really, really helpful. But it's it's, now like putting that in action because i've been thinking we've been hiring we've been working on all of that and it's really just like putting i don't know pedal to the metal feet to the ground i don't know exactly the an analogy but um a big a big other thing that we have um is we're wrapping up a number of um, operational transformation projects in june um so uh, back in 2021 um, the city had $10 million to do projects focusing on efficient and equitable services for Philadelphia residents. Um, we have six projects in that category um, and it's establishing a digital forms practice in the Office of Innovation and Technology, um, our um, OIT apprenticeship program, which has brought um, folks, existing employees um, in the city into software engineering and user experience teams. Um, by providing training and then having them do an apprenticeship with us. Um, usability testing, which has been something that's been really traditionally hard to fund because it's really hard to figure out how to pay for gift cards or incentives for uh, participants. Um, wrapping up work on the Equitable Community Engagement Toolkit website, which is we partner with the Service Design Studio and Mayor's Office of Civic Engagement and Volunteer Services and like, by partner, I mean, we are doing a small part that is the website and they've done a ton of amazing work and research on what it looks like to engage equitably with residents. Um, translations for Phil.gov, which has been chiefly you know, the service design studio and the office of, or sorry, not service design studio, the software engineering team and um, the office of immigrant affairs. So providing more um, standardized translations on Phil.gov and um, lastly, we're partially important, a part of this uh, project with the Department of Records working to um, replace the paper-based system of delivering public safety reports. So all of those projects are wrapping up in June and that feels like so much, um, 
we've been able to staff up. And I think the, the OTF fund has been really great in assisting that, but it's, it's going to be a lot. Um, <laughs> I was going to say that that is quite a list, um, and and to think that you're that you're doing and working on all of that as well as just baseline fila.gov services. So um, bravo and congrats on on also staffing up and being able to um, tackle all of that. Um, would love to hear more as we think about this idea of staffing and of of the people that we need to bring into our local governments to. Um, be digital ready or digital first. Um, what are some of the skills and um, talents and abilities that you're always looking for when you're hiring? Um, and and what are some things that you, that you would hope that a listener, you know, might consider augmenting or or enhancing on their resume if they want to work, um, you know, in a digital services capacity? That's a really good question. I feel like. Um... I, and I, I've been thinking, you know, I've been working with a few groups um, or been a part of a few conversations with some really great groups. And I've been thinking a lot about our hiring practices and how important I think it is for folks to really just want to work for the city. Like working for government is not easy um, at all. Um, I hate to say like, but you need to be resilient. You have to be able to like be willing to cut through red tape and wait and understand like sometimes the scale of the work you need to do needs to scale back or sometimes you can't move forward on a really great project because policies not, might not be in place to, to allow it to be successful um, or you need to pause on something because maybe tech isn't the solution. Um, but I would say that like just understanding and understanding, like it's being patient and being understanding and working within the constraints of the system. Um, I, I really value like cover letters right now because we always do ask for one and I read every single one of them because I want you to be invested in the city and not just use this as like a stepping stone um, or, or something that, you know, like at the end of the day, the work that we do is very meaningful and I feel like it's very important and it's what keeps me here, but it's, it's, it's challenging. Um, and we're working on building out what, you know, we're working on building out easier pathways, but I really want people to understand that like right now it's, it's, it's tough. And I love that you um, reinforced the importance of a good cover letter. Um, I think that came up during the job fair back in December when we were talking with folks about um, getting a job in government. Um, the value of a of a well written cover letter, and then also answering those supplemental questions. So, thanks for reinforcing um, yes. that, especially for our listeners um, who are job seeking. Um, if you could go back in time ten years um, and give give yourself some professional advice, um, what would you tell yourself? That is tough. Um, I think I would say to myself, like, not to settle and understand your worth. I had a job that I wasn't comfortable, like, bringing my whole self to work at. Like, I just wasn't comfortable being myself at work. And I stayed in that job for a little bit too long. So I really think that understanding that, like, if, like, you are valuable and your workspace should respect you and you should feel valued when you're, you're there. I love it. And again, a reminder, especially when things get tough and when government work is hard, um, finding a network to depend on and to reach out to. Um, and that's, you know, precisely what we're trying to do, um, both with the digital service network and then also with ELGL, um, who's hosting this podcast. So, um, so thanks for that, that great reminder. And then any advice for our listeners, um, who, want to better use um, design and technology in their local government, um, but aren't quite sure, you know, what's that that first step? Yeah, I would say like understanding the landscape. And I, I think a lot about like how grateful I am for the support that I've had in the city and like just from leadership, from the team, from, from kind of like all, like the city of Philadelphia was ready for this. And I knew that if there was a point where they weren't like pushing for it and this space was not gonna work and it would like, I would get burned out and frustrated and they would get frustrated with me. But I think that really understanding like 
what the city or like the space you're working in or attempting to work in is ready for is is great. But um, also making sure that, you know, you're not just, I want to say like running in and wiping things clean. We've worked with so many partners who have worked for the city for like 10 plus years and they have a wealth of understanding and a wealth of institutional knowledge. And that was, you know, one of the really interesting things that we wanted to do with our um, apprentices was by bringing existing, you know, city employees who have that dedication, have that understanding of working with like within the city's constraints and within the space, bringing them into our teams is very valuable. So I think making sure that you use whoever you're working with as a partner, as opposed to a client is really important. We do like engagement agreements or like with our statements of work, we talk about what we expect from our partners. And that usually is a, a few hours a week as a commitment for you to kind of give us feedback on what we're building or what we're trying to do. So I really think like the partnership is stressed and those like having that um, understanding of where they're coming from and excuse me, stepping them along the way is really, really important. I feel like kindness and respect and listening have been just core themes that I've heard um, from you and all of these responses. And I just want to recognize and, and call that out um, and name it because it really is, you know, the foundation of the work that you're doing. Um, would love to give you one last chance um, before we start to wrap things up um, to tell us about um, something that you're proud of that you're working on currently or that your team's working on. I don't know. I I think I'm like everything. Um, I feel like there's so many different facets. I just, I'm really happy where Phil.gov is. I'm really happy where like we've been able to do this usability testing and, you know, it's like, I just think we have like really great team. And I, I think, yeah, I guess the, the team is probably the thing I'm most proud of. Like the space we're creating, the people we've been able to hire or keep and um, the work what we're going to, like the opportunity we have. So I really, really appreciate that. Like that's what I'm most like, we're, we're definitely still like building out a lot of our processes and thinking through like what our strategy is, but the work that everyone has done and the value that they've like, they push so hard and that's so, that's like from every role is just amazing. So I want to ask you a question that we ask to wrap up every interview. Um, and so I just want to hear why local government? Why do you work in public service? I think it's because like I love, I love the city. And I love, you know, I love the fact that I can do um, meaningful work. At, at the end of the day, like I'm I'm proud to say, like, oh, I've been a part of that team and I've helped that work happen. A great answer. And I'm seeing some comments in the chat of other people that love your Philly team as well. So um, it is just a reminder that it always comes back to the people. Um, and then, you know, the technology comes second. So thanks for reinforcing that. So the real last question of the podcast, and sometimes people say this is the toughest question of the interview. If you could be the Dove Love DJ, what song would you pick as the exit music for this episode? So that is truly the toughest question because there's a lot of, like, I have a lot of thinking going into this, but at the end of the day, I would choose Lizzo Special because if you haven't listened to that, you need to, because it just like, it'll warm your soul and it's appropriate for everything. Um, <laughs> and you brought it full circle because she is your celebrity yes. best friend as well. Yes, yes. I mean, I gotta, you know, help her out. She... <laughs> Well, and we're getting we're getting a lot of positive reinforcement in the chat. Hopefully for our listeners who are listening to this episode, um, you're able to find that um, joy and to remember that the work that we do is special when we work in public service. So Sarah, thank you so much for coming on and for chatting with me on DevLab. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This ends Appreciate our it. episode for today. Um, GovLove is produced by a rotating cast of ELGL volunteers. ELGL is the Engaging Local Government Leaders Network. You can reach ELGL on Twitter at GovLovePodcast. And if you'd like to get involved with this new network that we're building here at the Beck Center in partnership with U.S. Digital Response, the Digital Service Network, please visit us at beckcenter.georgetown.edu. 
We are a growing peer learning network that supports an open, collaborative, and nimble network of government leaders who use technology, data, and design to improve and innovate public services. Thank you for listening. This has been GovLove, a podcast about local government. Girl, cause she just wanted to change. How could you thorns if you ain't been through a pain? That's why we feel so alone. That's why we feel so ashamed. Mm-hmm.